Hey everybody, I think we're going to get started. Uh, speaking next is Forth uh, Davis, who's with the Aerospace Corporation and also is on the FreeBSD report team. And he'll be talking about using FreeBSD to promote uh, open source development methods. Thank you, Warner. Uh, yeah, so. First thing, of course, yeah, so, uh, I'm, I'm going to start talk by talking about uh, uh, what, what's this talk about anyway. So it's uh, the title, like, uh, what are we from the BSD of tomorrow? Yeah. Sort of so it really could be anything. Um, so we're going to be talking about, about two, two main things. One is Aerosource, which is a project within our company to promote uh, open source development methods, sort of reform the, uh, the culture of software development uh, or smaller, more ad hoc projects within the company. And uh, also FreeBSD's role in there, both as a, as a hosting platform for the system and also as an example for uh, what open source methods can achieve. So uh, first I need to explain a bit what our company is about. Uh, the, the Aerospace Corp from the website, the Aerospace Corporation uh, is a, operates a federally funded research and development center in support of national security space. Uh, civil and commercial space programs. The basic, uh, what, what that means is that, that we work on every aspect of engineering related to space systems. That's uh, uh, the obvious things like satellites and sensors on satellites, and launch vehicles, and uh, ground systems, and uh, ground systems infrastructure, software development related to that. Um, and in general, what we do is we provide objective technical advice to try and uh, keep programs on track as well as doing research so that you know we are uh, the smartest people in the room and we really know what we're doing so that we can actually provide that advice. Um, we're uh, 1,400 maybe, or uh, 2,400 maybe even 2,500 engineers um, in, in really every discipline of engineering um, from uh, civil engineering to uh, software engineering. Um, and honest to goodness rocket scientists. Um, and then spread around the US, our main office is in El Segundo, California. We have about 2,000 people there. Um, so at the company, we have sort of two main camps of, of software development in, in terms of software culture. Uh, there's classic software engineers. These are the people who ensure that programs um, that are building satellites get the right software on the satellites. You screw it up and you blue screen, it's over. You know? And that might be a billion dollars down the drain. So, um, you know, they do big, expensive software. Um, and and it's, that's very critical. But that's to do that, and, and they have processes that are known to work and are reliable, but they're big and expensive, both in terms of time commitment and in terms of just the overall cost, uh, just, just in terms of the scope of, of things. There's lots of verification and validation. There's lots of uh, really difficult change control processes. Uh, for instance, I worked on some software once where we didn't bother fixing you know, typos in comments because who wants to spend three hours on fixing a typo? Uh, and, and so you know, that didn't happen. And there's, so you know, it's big stuff. It works, but um, it's not, not suitable for everything. And then there's engineering support software. This is the sort of stuff that's written to solve, you know, the problem you've got to solve today, or the problem you've got to solve this year. Um, it's it's typically written by domain experts who are not software engineers, and perhaps have absolutely no training in software development. Um, you know, they, they may well have learned to program from a book, or from starting hacking on some Fortran by somebody else who learned to program from a book, or who learned APL back when we had weird keyboards to make that work. Um, but, you know, while this stuff is ad written ad hoc and whatnot, many, many pieces live on. Uh, we have software in some cases that uh, uses Fortran features that were de deprecated oh, in 77, so they're, they've been deprecated essentially my entire life. Um, so, yeah, so, so for them, for the people, so this stuff is important, despite the fact that it's fairly ad hoc. Um, however, there's often very minimal process around this software. Um, in, in one case, one project we worked on that was actually fairly advanced for uh, many of, compared to many of the projects we bumped into, 
their revision control system was that they had a file server somewhere, and people edited those files directly, and to keep from colliding, they had a whiteboard where they wrote down who was editing what. Um, you know, if you've worked on a big project, you know how well that's likely to work. Um, they did, in fact, have problems where they'd be, you know, develop a feature, they'd even ship it in a release or two, and then at some point it would disappear. Um, because somebody else grabbed their old copy of the file, wrote it over the top, and oops, it went away. Um, so you know, that, that was a, a chronic problem for them. And that, that so you know, that, that was a big issue, they, that they, they needed some more structure, but they rightly feared you know, the classic soccer belt and mentality they saw. Um, you know, some more problems that, that, that we've seen with, this, with their uh, software development methods are um, we've got code all over the place, um, but you know, it's locked away in individual people's uh, offices or within their groups. Um, so there's a lot of duplicated code. You know, the world probably only needs one parser for two card satellite, uh, uh, satellite orbit uh, uh, data sets, but there's probably quite a number of them laying around the company. Uh, certainly, I know I rewrote one um, that was hopeless. Um, you know, or in other cases, as I was saying, we have, we have really archaic code um, that uses deprecated or dead language features um, and just plain obsolete practices. Um, I bumped into some code a week or so ago where I really wish they were, the programmer was using Python because at least then they would have had to indent uh, their code. C code all right aligned, it does not read well. Um, some, some more issues, uh, no, often no version control. So as I was saying, stuff gets lost. Um, it's very, very, you know, it's very distressing to the users who requested the feature, and in some cases paid for the feature, uh, when it goes away. Um, so sometimes you can't figure out you know, why things broke. It's a common problem anytime you don't have revision control. You just know that at some point something went wrong, and uh, you, know, you don't know if it was that two people went into different files and changed an API, or, or what happened there. Um, also, you know, repeat, related to the things getting lost, um, releases aren't repeatable. So you don't really know, you know, you, 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 don't, you can't reproduce a release with just a patch applied to it, unless you can figure out where you saved that copy off on the file server somewhere of the files you built, assuming that you know, there wasn't a system crash. Um, there's also uh, issues with locks on files, uh, meaning that people can't work in those files, or sometimes they do it anyway, and then you get you know the lost the lost uh, changes issue. Um, so it's a waste of developer time. And some of these projects do have you know close to you know do have two or three people working more or less full time on them. So there's a fair bit of uh, time and expense going into them. Now. My group's perspective is that open source methods can sort of come to the rescue here. Um, if we have proven strategies for developing software. You know, they produce great software like, like the various BSD operating systems, like Apache, like Postgres, like that kind of an operating system, um, that sort of thing. And uh, so, but, but the methods are typically fairly low friction. Um, you know, as, as Kurt likes to say, developers have day jobs. Probably, you know, your project comes last. Um, you know, so that's uh, so, so. So necessarily, these methods have to be fairly lightweight, and we think that they're really suited for these these types of engineering support applications, both in terms of having processes that work and having technologies that work and are usually free. Um, you know, once you buy a server or whatnot. Um, so, so we're trying to provide an alternative uh, to these users and to promote that to the users. Uh, also, we want to get the code out there and spread around the company um, so, so that people can see each other's code, they can work from each other's stuff. Um, and, you know, in some cases, we do have projects that are building libraries, but in many cases, you know, people are just writing thousands and thousands of lines of code, and somebody else is probably duplicating that code uh, somewhere else in a different project. Um, and of course, the fact that these tools are free means that there are many that uh, there, there are going to be less cost objections. You know, when people come out and start looking at some of the big, big revision control, commercial revision control systems, cost is a big issue. Um, they are, you know, many thousands of dollars per seat. And well, you know, a rational person looking at things and saying we're paying on a, you know, we're paying on an average a quarter million dollars a year for an engineer, we can afford a thousand dollars worth of software to save them a few days. 
Um, but sometimes that doesn't fly with people. They have a hard time making that cost decision. So what we're promoting is a concept called enterprise source software. The idea is that it's exactly like open source software, except it's only within the enterprise, so only within the company. That means you have sort of the classic four freedoms that you can read code, you can read the code within the enterprise, you can build and run the code with the enterprise, you can make changes, and you can re redistribute those changes. Um, classic stuff, except it's within the company, because we have a fair bit of stuff that's you know, somewhat sensitive. Obviously, we work for the work for the uh, military, so there are those sorts of issues. And in many cases, it's just difficult to get approval for anything that's not uh, not obviously unrelated uh, to those things, to releasing that stuff. Yeah. yeah. And, and so one, one thing though is is that some people, when we first talked to this about that, oh, that means you know that we run we run Linux or we run run BSD or use Apache. No, it's not what it is. It's about using these methods uh, within the company. It is worth noting that the enterprise source software first can become open source software, and we hope that in some cases we will push push people more in that direction so they can engage the broader community. Um, we have we have a number of applications that are widely used by by, for instance, NASA NASA JPL and other NASA centers and uh, some other contractors. Where probably there is an argument for releasing a good portion of that code. To a wider community and getting more, uh, getting benefits from that. Um, also, open source. In some cases, we may be taking open source software and sort of just keep making modifications that we keep in house. Um, you know, as, as Warner was saying in his talk earlier, there's good benefits to pushing things back, but sometimes you know that's not practical for whatever reason. Whether it's you're entangling with IP issues or simply the things you're doing, you know, are just too weird. No one else would ever do that. So it's not something you need to you, that that anyone's going to want to take back. Um, a little detour here. In, in, in promoting enterprise source, we talk about many many different open source things. But FreeBSD is one of our biggest examples of how how a project can work. That's because I and the other people on our team are most familiar with it, but also because it's you know such a great project. At least, you know, I think so. Um, it, it shows what what can be achieved with with uh, open source methods, and also gives examples of different things, such as communications, repository management, release management, um, and, and that sort of thing. So it's sort of the technical aspects of how do you put together a project um, that might be distributed, and we are a fairly distributed company, um, and, and how, how you can manage all that stuff in a reasonably lightweight manner. Um, yeah, there's, there's a number of great examples of, you know, of, of material on this as well, such as uh, Robert Watson's talk on how the project FreeBSD project works, um, or the meta talk on how the how to give the talk about the FreeBSD how the FreeBSD project works. I decided to try and out Robert Watson, Robert Watson, and there's 14 slides on this slide. Um, now, now I'm going to introduce Aerosource, which is our implementation of sort of a gathering place for people to work on their enterprise source software. Um, what it is is essentially a, a, a web-based uh, system, essentially similar to SourceForge. Our actual implementation is with the track uh, version control for the, the track um, web interface and subversion is the version control system uh, sitting on top of FreeBSD. Our goals with Aerosource are, of course, to promote enterprise source software, and in particular, to promote code reuse by, by requiring that people who use our infrastructure um, make their source available to other people. Um, we're also trying to provide good, develop, good development tools to developers. And these, these two goals are somewhat in conflict in that there are some users within the company who would like to use the tools, but for, for a variety of reasons, such as requiring people to sign NDAs uh, in order to work on the code, um, they're not able to use Aerosource as it is. They're also trying to somewhat modernize the uh, general development process by introducing these new tools. Um, sort of, you know, we're not trying to bring people to you know, the latest and greatest in, uh, in programming technology. We're not really uh, aggressively pushing, for instance, uh, extreme programming methodologies or anything like that, or distributed version control. Sort of just trying to drag people out of the 70s. Um, sort of 
sorry, into the modern era where we do have tools that they're that are relatively easy to use. They're fairly well developed, and uh, and, and just sort of get get people used to the idea of that there are tools that can support their process. So a little bit about when we started to build Aerosource, we'll talk a little bit about our, what we decided we wanted to do, um, what we'd hoped to do. You know, as I said, sort of building a SourceForge.net was our, for, for internal use, was our, what we wanted. So but the specific features we were looking for out of that um, were that we, you know, of course, needed version control, needed web access to that version control so that people could search and we could browse. Um, we also needed, uh, well, it isn't on here, we needed, uh, uh, multi-platform version control since we have not only do we have users using um, Windows and Mac OS and various Unixes, we actually have some software that runs on all of them. Um, so that needs to be developed simultaneously on all of those. Uh, we also needed, of course, bug and issue tracking. Not all of our projects use it, but it, but definitely it's a key feature. Um, and, and then we wanted some website and document management functionality. And ideally, it should all be tightly integrated and internal, and then inter entirely internal to our company. So we didn't have to worry about all the details of our software release process or anything like that. Um, so in addition to all of those desires, um, we were funded with a very small amount of money to get this started. We had a few months to get off the ground. And so we needed something that would be easy to maintain and operate, operate and modify because um, it was uncertain what our continuing funding would be, and we didn't want to be in a situation where we have you know, ongoing regular maintenance and we'd end up stranding our users or uh, having to waste a lot of our time uh, extorting money from them uh, in order to keep working. So we looked at a number of options. We looked at SourceForge and GForge, which was a fork and then rewrite uh, early on. We also looked at Track, um, actually, after the fact, we looked at Retrospectiva, and then sort of an ad hoc, uh, you know, CBS plug, plus plug, Bugzilla plus a wiki sort of approach. Um, SourceForge and GForge we actually rejected because we did, we'd already set them up. One of our one of our people had set up SourceForge at another company, and we actually already had GForge set up. Um, in both cases, upgrades were exceptionally painful. Um, the my coworker who did the initial track installation said that. It took uh, a tenth the time to do the track install from scratch than it took to do his last GeForge upgrade. Um, so we, we decided that was not going to happen. We didn't want a system where a minor upgrade took days. Um, so so those, those were pretty much out. Um, track, track is what we ended up with, obviously. Um, Retrospectiva is a rewrite of track, which um, the nice thing about it is that it's written in um, I believe it's a Ruby on Rails application, but the key is that it's in a more modern web framework, um, whereas Track is PHP, or no, sorry, it's Python. Um, it's, it's a Python application, but written without the aid of, of, the, the more con of some of the more modern frameworks. So it's a little messier, and they do a little more coding themselves, a, a little more work themselves, which makes it harder to, to do some modifications. Um, Retrospectiva probably wouldn't be selected today, however, because it's still not, it, it, it's, it's still got basically the same weaknesses as track in most areas. Uh, for instance, they both have somewhat weak wikis. Um, we, the other, finally, the you know the the CVS uh, or subversion plus plus the other tools option we ruled out because we wanted integration and it felt like we were going to have to hack that integration between every between those pieces into each component separately, um, all of which are probably written in entirely different ways. So it would have been fairly difficult. Um, so we ended up with track and plus subversion as, as our uh, as our implementation. Uh, so here's a, here's our little picture, nice stack of open source applications with with FreeBSD and on the bottom, of course, and then uh, uh, post, Postgres, track, Apache, and subversion. And uh, of course, we eat our own dog food, so all of this stuff lives in an, in an Aerosource repository, uh, and we manage all of it. Uh, manage all of our configuration through that. So now I'll talk a little bit about our experiences uh, with uh, 
with the um, with error source. Uh, it generally found that existing users who were already using CVS or Subversion um, were quite happy to move over. They really were, were very interested in doing so. Nothing else, it was less work for them because we were already managing the system, we're already handling backups, and we're basically overdoing um, you know, deep beyond running SDN and NIST. Um, so uh, for, for them, that, that's been an easy sell. Um, newer projects, um, have, have, we've, had, we've had some pretty good pickup. When people are starting a new, new project, typically these have been small projects, you know, deciding, oh, we've got a bunch of different you know, MATLAB libraries, as one example, or IDL libraries um, that we'd like to start collecting a little more and, and, and rolling together. Um, you know, those sort of people said, oh, you know, we've heard about this version control thing. We think it's probably a good idea. Um, so we'll come talk to you, and, and, and we've been able to bring those sorts of people in. Um, we've also brought in uh, some, some large existing projects. Um, for instance, uh, a program called SOAP, confusingly, the Satellite Orbital Analysis Program, um, not the, uh, the uh, um, Web Services Protocol. Um, but uh, they, they've been around at the company uh, in some form since the 80s on some early, very uh, proprietary graphics systems. Now they're a cross-platform QT-based application um, that runs on Mac OS, Windows, and Unix. Um, so we've, we've been able to bring them in and, and a couple other long-standing projects. Um, however, we have encountered some resistance to the enterprise source concept from some camps. And I'll talk about those a little more. Um, we've, we've got a lot of objections. Uh, from, from some people. A lot of people say, but it's my code. Well, no. You know, this is work for hire. Um, this is our, this is the company's code. Um, but, you know, we've had to deal with that. In many cases, management hasn't been willing to force the issue there. Um, there's the classic concern that many people have that their code is embarrassingly bad. In some cases, that's in fact true. Uh, but in, a, in many cases, it's not actually all that bad. And uh, we, we feel in many ways that if they were to uh, bring it out and it's actually useful, that they find people who would help them improve it and generally make it better. Um, you know, one, one that, that totally baffles me is that we've actually had people say, but you know, we can't, you know, share this, this uh, you know, say a, a satellite propagation algorithm because we make everyone who's in the department re-implement it when, the, when they arrive to prove that they can do it. Um, you know, they say it's a rite of passage. Uh, it seems like a waste of time to me, um, but uh, you know, there you have it. Or perhaps you know, maybe maybe they need to rethink that process, and uh, they should be building a whole library of them where everyone has to implements a new one within that library and make it available. Um, other other people uh, have, have said you know that only I can maintain this code or only I can use it correctly. Um, we, we've had had a number of people say you know. We can't let anyone modify this because we get blamed even if somebody else modifies it and uses it. Uh, when something goes wrong, um, at some level that's probably true. In general, it would be nice if they would uh, be a little, become a little more tolerant to getting yelled at to help provide, you know, and, and provide more resources to the rest of us uh, so we don't have to re-implement these things. Um, the strangest one was people might, you know, like our project and give us additions, and then we'd have to deal with them. That would be horrible. Um, you know, I, I, I have a really hard time uh, fathoming that one, but I've had I had a group of five or six people tell me that with a straight face, that that was their biggest objection. Um, so a few of the projects that we have in Aerosource are Aerosource itself. Um, we keep a copy of track in there that we have our, some of our modifications in. Um, we also keep all of our configuration files and source tutorials. This, these slides live in there, for instance. Um, Aeroports is our internal ports collection. Um, it's sort of grafted onto the side of the ports collection as a, as a separate directory. And we've got, some, we've got a, a tool stored in there that uh, allows you to update uh, your ports, the, the freebie, standard FreeBSD <coughs> ports using PortSnap plus the Aeroports and uh, merge them together. Um, there's uh, Avance, which is a, a telemetry analysis program. Fellowship, which is the cluster that I built and maintain. Um, we keep a lot of configuration information, sample code, that sort of thing. And several other projects, including the SOAP project I mentioned earlier, 
we're now up to, I think, 65 projects as of last week. Now, now I'll talk a little about the maintenance of Aerosource, and this is sort of gets more into how we use FreeBSD. Um, you know, we're into eating our own dog food here and using using the functionality that we that we provided um, to ensure that you know it stays working and that we uh, we run into we run into issues that that our users might confront eventually, so we can add add new functionality. Um, so we store configuration, custom module scripts, that sort of thing. Um, you know, the project's homepage, uh, where you come to app to request a new project, is just another uh, Aerosource instance, another another track instance. Um, and, and we use this ticket system for managing a lot of things, uh, including system management tests. Uh, pretty much the system is, your, is a standard FreeBSD system. It's the, uh, the uh, uh, standard ports collection plus arrow ports bolted onto the side where we store custom version of uh, the PAM LDAP modules that let us deal with our strange corporate LDAP schema um, and that sort of thing. And then we have separate backups, etc. A um, little more on aeroports. Um, let's see, we do, yeah, it's a, it's a, we have a bootstrapping meta port that we store in there that we use for both aerosource systems and other systems. We can bring up FreeBSD systems fairly quickly, get all the basic admin tools that you might want for debugging and uh, system maintenance. Um, we also use Aeros Aeroports as, a, as an incubator um, for, uh, for ports where we'll commit, we'll, we'll put things in there, hack on them a bit, um, have somewhere to work on them while we decide whether or not they're useful to the general public or while we're still building up the infrastructure to make them sensible. Uh, for instance, uh, I'm working on some new ports for Octoforge uh, which are extension modules for Octave, and o Octave is a, a MATLAB workalike. Uh, so I'm work working on new ports in there, and I've got, there's really no point in trying to commit them to FreeBSD until I have you know, at least five or 10 of them ported, um, and I, I can build up a framework, which means I need to you know, keep working through them. Um, so it's really handy for that. Um, yeah. So that they, they live in a little add-on directory, uh, and the, the concept that I'm using, the particular concept I'm using is a, uh, one suggested by uh, Scott Hutzel, um, where you just have a single directory and you don't actually make any modifications to the rest of the ports tree. Um, and it it uh, just uses some outside wrappers to merge the index files with, uh, with, the, uh, with a, a description file from our ports tree. And the tool we use to do that is a tool called APT, slightly confusingly, but hey, um, I don't know what that means, so it's not too confusing to me. Um, but uh, so it, it, integrate, it, it integrates ports and ports tools. And basically, the syntax is the same as port snap, um, except it uses the dash L option. I convinced Colin to add, uh, add the port snap to, to merge things together. Um, So some quick conclusions. Um, overall, I think we're, we're, uh, we've been successful in attracting new customers. Um, I think we're currently adding one or two projects every week. So we do have some growing momentum within the company, at least within some portions. Uh, definitely people like that, that, that we have these free tools, that they work fairly well, um, they're very, and, and that they're generally uh, efficient and effective. Uh, we haven't really pushed much beyond sort of basic tool use yet. Uh, but we're working in that direction. Um, I think probably SOAP in particular will start doing releases soon, and so we'll have to be, begin training them on how to manage branches in, in a sensible manner and how to, how to do patching and whatnot. But uh, I, think, I think we'll be able to do that once they get there. And uh, so that's going well. Overall, I think we're gaining traction. And uh, well, we've got some work to do in some areas. It's definitely improving the situation within the company. Uh, people are taking advantage of these tools and generally are, uh, are, I think, doing a better job of developing their software as a result of, of the tools and sort of the example we're setting with, uh, with this FreeBSD based infrastructure. So, with that, I'd like to ask if there are any questions.
Freunde. 